There is always a challenge in trying to reconcile the gap between when the scriptures were written and when they arrive to us later in time. How do we reconcile from the time scripture has been read to the times that we live in now? It's quite simple. We believe in the real presence in scripture, in the real presence of Christ amongst us when we read his holy word. So regardless of what time we live in, being removed a thousand or two thousand years from these words, Christ is ever present with his people throughout time. And so the reading of scripture allows us to come into the presence of God. I want to speak to that person today who is alone. I want to speak to the person today who is poor. I want to speak to the person today who has been forgotten. I want to speak to the person today who's been taken advantage of. I want to speak to that person today, finally, who as a result of all these things is carrying a heavy burden. Maybe you've had a loved one pass, and today you are a widow. Maybe you've been in a divorce and today you are alone. Maybe your partner left you for another and the wound is still fresh today. Maybe you're an orphan Though you had parents, they were not really there. And maybe because of all of these things today, you are carrying, carrying heavy burdens in life, financially, emotionally, and spiritually. Maybe this is speaking to you as a result right now. You might be saying, Father Aster, if you only knew. No one really knows what I've experienced, what I've gone through, what I'm going through, what I'm carrying. It seems like the waters I've been, it seems like I've been in deep waters for a long time, Father Aster sinking in miry depths. The sea has reached my neck. Does this describe you? How could I know these things? How could I know these things if this just describes you? Christ is speaking to you now. So, Please listen. The Lord your God sees you. He who keeps you does not sleep. The waters of life will not swallow you up. No. As the psalmist says, for the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. Bless is the man who puts their trust and hope in the Lord. Your God reigns. Cry out to him right now. Abba Father, help me. 
Cry out to him right now. Abba, Father, help me. Deliver me from the snare of the fowler. My dear friend, the Lord your God is mighty to save. May these words minister, you, minister to you today. And may you not lose hope. The waters will not swallow you up. The world today is not what God envisioned, far from it. Often it operates with those who have and those who have not. Like in the ancient world, in our current day, the more money one has, the higher the status. And the higher one's status, the more power one has. But it doesn't only apply to economics. In today's world, having a family, a companion, a partner, a spouse, a child, friends, and even good health, gives you a higher status and a sense of power as a result. Well, what if you don't have these things? What if you don't have much money? What if you don't have a family? What if you don't have a spouse, a partner? What if you don't have children? What if you don't have a large network of friends? What if you don't have good health? Then what? Then what? Does that mean you're less important? Does that mean you're less valuable? Does that mean you're like, less likely to influence and succeed in this world? Maybe in the eyes of the world. Maybe in the eyes of politicians. And maybe, dare I say, even in the eyes of the religious. But not in the eyes of God. Not in the eyes of the Lord and not in the eyes of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. No, to the contrary. For such people, Jesus came into the world. For I came, not for the righteous, but for sinners. I didn't come here for the healthy, but for the sick. I didn't come here for those who have much, but to those who have very little. I came to those who cry out to me, Lord, have mercy, I do not have much. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who persecute you for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Does that describe you? Are you one after God's own heart? Is he the single reason why you live, why you wake up in the morning, carry out your day, and go to sleep? Do you firm the collect of guidance? In you we live and move and have our being. If so, my dear friend, be of good cheer. The Lord sees you. God is well pleased with you. For first you seek his righteousness and all other things will be given to you. You will not be left hungry. You will not be left thirsty. You will not be left wanting. No. He will give you all that you need. He has given you 
the most precious of gifts. In Jesus, you and I have the blessed Son of God. Think about that. You and I, in Jesus, have the blessed Son of God. And we are not only His child, the fathers, but we are also the Son's bride. This is the mystical union between Christ and His church. And like every marriage, you are grounded and united in love, His love, which becomes a seal upon our hearts and a mantle upon our shoulders and a crown upon our heads. This is the covenant faithfulness of God. The Lord your God will not forsake you, for He Himself has become a covenant to us. Between the Father and us, Jesus Christ has become a covenant for us. Yes, my dear friends, you and I in Christ, who on earth might be poor, might be alone, might not have family or friends, or even good health, are actually the envy of the world. For we are kings and queens, inheritors of heavenly riches, prepared for us from the foundations of the earth that awaits us. In some ways, we already have. He welcomes, anoints, and blesses us in his divine life, in the life of God. What could be more, better, whether in heaven or on earth, than to be in the life of God. Now we worship every Sunday. And what we do here on Sunday is we're, we're participating in the life of God on earth. When we process and we sing songs, when we bow our heads, when we come to our knees, when we offer songs and praises, we believe that Christ is present and we are participating in the life of God. This is the metaphysical reality that takes place in corporate worship every Sunday through God's word and sacrament. But one day, we will sit at the table of the great marriage supper of the Lamb. Yes. Now what's this all about? This is all about today's gospel reading we read in Mark chapter 12. The teaching has to do with those who have and those who have not. But ironically, as with the paradox of the kingdom, that those who appear, that appear to have much have very little. And those who have very little in truth have much. All throughout Mark's gospel, no one seems to understand who Jesus truly is, his identity. John the Baptist tried. There he was in the wilderness crying out, preparing the way of the Lord. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the kingdom, in the good news. The good news. Is this a new phrase in the first century? Was this a development just in recent times? No. 700 years before Jesus, the great prophet Isaiah prophesied that one day, the Lord would return to his people after a period of judgment, the exile, and that his people would declare, for their eyes would see something of great importance. They would see their God. 
How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, the Evangelion, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your Lord reigns. What is the good news? The good news is that the Lord your God reigns. Your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. For the Lord your God returns to Zion. They will see with their very own eyes, burst into songs of joy and praise. Your, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. This was the promise given from the prophet Isaiah to us. God is going to come back. But how is he going to come back? He's going to come back as a king. And every king has a rule. And every king has a rule in a kingdom. And every kingdom has a people. And every people have a land. And every people in that kingdom, with a king, have a law. And that is love. And that is the love that this king bestows upon his people through his rule on his land for the sake of his kingdom. And so Jesus enters the story of God in the first century, traveling through Galilee, proclaiming the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Again, what is the good news? That the Lord your God reigns as a king. God comes back to his people as a king. Meaning you and I worship a king. God is not just some distant abstract idea somewhere in the cosmos where we can't see or personalize or relate with him. No, like I said, every time we gather on Sunday when we process throughout the service and recess, we are worshiping the king of kings. And you are kings and queens. He is the king of kings, the king of queens. That is the God we worship in real time, in real place. That means we lack nothing because we've been invited into his kingdom. Because we are his people. Your God has come and he reigns. And yet the people of Jesus' time did not understand this. From casting out unclean spirits, cleansing lepers, healing paralytics, declaring he was the Lord of the Sabbath, reconstituting the 12 tribes of Israel by appointing 12 disciples, calming the storm on the sea, healing the blind, feeding 5,000, walking on water, entering Jerusalem on a donkey, cleansing the temple, and yet they don't seem to understand who he is. How much more must he do for them to understand? How much more does he need to do for us to remember this one truth that matters? Our God reigns, our God lives, and we serve him in truth, in life. Now Jesus finds himself in the temple courts the appropriate place for a king in the temple because there was always a debate who rules the temple? Was it the high priest or the king? For Jesus, he says, yes. For he is both the king and the high priest. And it is appropriate in the final days of his life, he finds himself in the temple teaching again who he is and what he's all about. Now, right before the passage we read in Mark chapter 12, verses 35 to 37, Jesus overturns this belief that he is David's son, the victor in the Davidic mold, as if he is just one of many kings that have come after, Jesus, after David as a descendant of David. No. No, he teaches there that he is not David's son, but he is David's Lord. 
For David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Jesus is not the son of David. He is the Lord of David. And therefore, if Jesus is Lord, he redefines what it means to be the Christ. His messiahship is different than that of David's and Solomon's and every other person that came and wore that crown, held that mantle. For his is different. This messiah, this anointed one is different. You see the kings, you see this king who in the first, who is in fact God, has come as the suffering servant. You see, he will not be enthroned as king in a palace but on a mountain. He will not be dressed in fine silk and linen, but will be stripped of his clothes in humiliation. No, he will not be draped with a purple robe around his shoulders, but rather have a wooden beam nailed to his body. And finally, a chalice full of wine will not be raised to the heavens, no, instead, a pool of blood will descend upon the earth. But this is how God becomes king. He becomes the suffering servant for his people. He has come to serve and to die on their behalf. And so he has taught and modeled what it means to be a person in the kingdom what it means to be a subject of the kingdom. And that is why his disciples, he says to his disciples, beware of these scribes, the scribes who walk around, who want to impress people, who want to lord it over them, who want to have the best seats in the house, who show off and try to impress people with their spiritual faith and their prayers, who actually devour widows, take advantage of them, No. You see, these people, these scribes that Jesus is pointing out are outside of the kingdom. They die outside of the kingdom. They will die outside of the kingdom. They are not to be modeled. They are not to be looked at and praised because they do not live like the king of the kingdom. They are not a good example. Do not follow their ways. Conversely, he points his disciples to the most unlikeliest of people, a poor widow. One who is a good example. One in which they can follow her ways. You see, it says that Jesus was watching. He's been watching the scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Zealots, the Sadducees, the Essenes. He's watching constantly. He's watching people's behavior. He's watching us. He's watching us as parents. He's watching us as children. He's watching us as husbands. He's watching us as wives. He's watching us as employees. He's watching us as employers. He's watching us as Christians. He's watching the world all the time. That is why I said, in the eyes of the world, yes, you might be forgotten. In the eyes of the world, yes, you are not important, but no, not in the eyes of God, because God is watching. No, not in the eyes of the Lord, for he is watching, and no, not in the eyes of the King of Kings, because he is looking at us. He is watching us. God is watching us all the time, and he sees something in these scribes, in these Pharisees, in the Zealots, in the Herodians, in the Sakari. Every group and sect you can imagine, he watched closely. And there he is in the temple as king and high priest. He is watching. For this is his base. This is his rule. This is his kingdom. But these are not his people. For they have forsaken the law in the kingdom. They are hoarding it. They are oppressing. They are judging. They are taking an advantage of. They are leaving alone. They are abusing. But not this widow. He sees 
many who are very wealthy put in large sums of money in the treasury. But then he calls his disciples, for he sees a poor widow, a poor widow, who puts two coins, the smallest, lightest, and the least valuable in circulation at the time, into the treasury box. And yet, he praises her. He says she has given, given more than all of these others put together. Now how can this be? How is it that she who's put in very little has given more and deserves more praise than those who've come before her and put much more in quantity? Because Jesus values the proportion of one's circumstance and the motive in their hearts. You see, for this poor widow, she loved God with all her heart, all her mind, all her soul, all her strength, and her neighbor. She was not like the scribe last week who was close not far from the kingdom. No, this woman had entered the kingdom. Because for her, God is the God of everything and all. He deserves everything I have. He deserves everything I have. Everything I have is God's. For her, who has nothing, is willing to give up, even in her poverty, the very last crumb she has to show God how much she worships him, how much she loves him, and how much she trusts him. How much she trusts him. There was no guarantee that the synagogues that were there to provide for widows would actually fulfill that law. But her faith clearly, implicitly, is that she trusted in the Lord. How about us? We who are alone, who are poor, who have no much friends, or maybe don't have the best health, do we trust in the Lord? Are we giving all and everything we have to the Lord, or do we hold back? Do we not trust in this God who sees us, who's watching? If he was watching 2,000 years ago, he's watching today. Regardless of the circumstance you find yourself in today, whether you have or you do not have, the Lord is watching. The Lord sees. He sees our hearts. Will we give everything and all? I can't answer that question for you. And you can't answer that question for me. But what are we doing here? Who are we worshiping? Who is our king? And is he worthy of everything and all? That's a question all of us have to answer. Are we afraid of the circumstances? I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of time. Well, that excuse goes out the window with this example. For this woman had nothing. Her livelihood she placed into the treasury box. And no one in the Gospel of Mark ever receives the praise she gets. I don't know about you, but I want that praise from God in his heart, in his mind, not for the public, in the sense that when I see him one day, God willing, he sees me as that poor widow. I don't have much, I don't have much. But by God's grace, I want to give everything I have in this life to him. I'm not saying I have, but I want to. That is my desire, so for God to so help me. I have failed tremendously, many times, holding back, afraid, not willing to go the extra mile. But my desire and my goal is to be all in, for God is the God of everything and all. For this poor widow, who am I not to? Live your lives fully to the pleasure and purposes of God. Give him everything you have of yourself. There isn't one square inch in the world that God doesn't claim as his. 
from your money, from your time, from your relationships, from your body, from your work, from your health, from your friends, from your family, everything you have. Do not be afraid. Give. Give. Give yourself, for he himself gave. There was nothing significant about his face, Isaiah says. There was nothing significant about his appearance. He was like the two coins in the world. Jesus himself was like the two coins. In the eyes of men, he wasn't valuable. In the eyes of the world, he was disposable. In the eyes of the world, he was a blasphemer. In the eyes of the world, he was a nuisance. But in the eyes of God, he was his blessed son in whom he was well pleased. You and I, in Christ, are the blessed sons and daughters, kings and queens of our Lord God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. I say the Shema this Sunday to remind you that we have a God. This God ring, reigns, and his reign is one of service and sacrifice. May we serve and sacrifice, serve people, and sacrifice ourselves on behalf of the world. That is the goal. That is the motive, that is the purpose, why we live. For we live and move and have our being in him. Jesus Christ means everything. He is the Alpha, he is the Omega. He is the beginning, he is the end. In fact, the Christ event, the one moment in history that all calendars and history is actually timelined, that is prior to history in the mind of God. I believe the Christ event in the mind of God, in the providence of God, took first place. In time, in history, in creation, it didn't. But in the mind and providence of God, the Christ event, the crucifixion, was in first place. Meaning, from the foundations of the earth, God was thinking of how he can serve and love us. That's what I'm saying. And so may we be encouraged today, be motivated, be inspired to give to give ourselves, to give our time, to give our money. I'm not just saying this because today is Covenant Sunday. We are going to make a covenant between us and God today. We're going to renew our baptismal vows. Let us ask God to help us. Help us live that life out in a way that honors Him, that believes in Him, that trusts in Him. He will not leave us hungry. He will not leave us alone. He will not leave us poor. He will not leave us without friends. And he will not leave us in poor health. For the Lord himself gives himself to us. May we not only receive these words in our ears, but also believe in them in our hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, speak to us after, after today, O oh God, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to speak to us and remind us of why we live. Thank you, O oh God, for living for us. May we live for you in every way possible. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.